Hi, everybody. Russ Barkley here. Not going gently into that good night, for sure. And in this part two of my presentation on whether or not ADHD is good for something, whether it's an adaptation, I want to discuss the more scientifically based theory of ADHD or of all genetically mediated psychopathologies. And this has been called the conveyor belt metaphor for how a maladaptive trait can remain within a population and at a stable rate of prevalence, despite the fact that it's maladaptive. So here we go. Now, let's take a look at the scientific alternative to the mismatch idea. You've got this genetic disorder. Some people claim it's an earlier adaptation that was successful, but isn't successful anymore in current culture. And that's why ADHD is still around. Now, there's an alternative explanation for why you can continue to have a certain percentage of the population have a neurogenetic, neurodevelopmental disorder or psychopathology, uh, and it isn't a mismatch. Uh, it is a result of mutations in genes that create deviant brain development. And this is known as the conveyor belt metaphor of neurodivergence and psychopathology. Got to get a little technical here, bear with me, but hopefully it will help you understand how a disorder can remain within a population, be maladaptive, which suggests that evolution should be, a natural selection should be selecting against it, and yet here it stays. It continues to be about, say, 5 to 8 percent, 5 to 10 percent of the population. So let's have a quick look at this idea. This idea was presented by Keller in several of his scientific reviews. He presents a great deal of evidence both against the cultural mismatch explanation for these disorders and a great deal of evidence for this particular mechanism, which is best thought of as a conveyor belt. So here's my bad attempt to draw a conveyor belt. We're going to start here at generation one, okay? And what we have are brand new mutations in genes that create the executive brain to give us normal self-regulation, or typical, if you will, if you don't like the word normal. And mutations are occurring in these genes that create different variants of the gene. We all have these genes, but people with ADHD have a different variant of that gene, a different sequence in that gene. So new mutations arise at generation one. They are going to give rise to ADHD in that generation. And if enough mutations occur, we're going to get a certain prevalence of ADHD. Let's just call it five to eight percent. OK, so that generation grows up. And as it's growing up, some of its members die off. We know that the risk of early death is twice as great to three times as great in children by age 10 and nearly five times as great in adults with ADHD by midlife than it is in the typical population. So some people with these genes are being, if you will, culled or selected out of the population before they breed. But others go on to breed. So now we get the inherited cases of ADHD being passed along to generation number two. And what happens then? OK, about let's say if the parent has ADHD, it's been estimated that about 40 to 50 percent of their offspring are going to have ADHD. So we've got these people surviving. Their genes are being passed on. We're getting more ADHD here. Right. And what happens in this generation? Same thing. Some of them die young before they are able to breed. So in both of these generations, some of the genes for ADHD are being removed. They're being selected against and pulled out of the population, and they're not being passed on. But most people with ADHD do survive. Many of them do go on to have children. And those genes are passed along and continue to exist in the population. So now we get into generation three. There's fewer of people with ADHD here compared to the earlier generations because some of them have been removed due to earlier death. But many of them survived and reproduced 
And so we have a certain prevalence of ADHD in this next population. And they survive to reproduce as well. But yet again, some of them are also going to be removed from the population before they have a chance to reproduce. And so you can see here that across generations, the genes for ADHD, which are maladaptive, but not so maladaptive that everybody dies young, but enough maladaptive that there's a higher death rate within the ADHD group before or after reproduction, no matter that is pulling these ADHD genes out of the population, and so on. Eventually, we reach a state at generation four or five or six out there where none of these original mutations over here are in the population any further, and all those genes are gone. And you can say, well, then ADHD is gone. Oh, no, it's not. Because remember, in each generation, we have new mutations giving rise to de novo cases that are going to go on this conveyor belt again. So there is this conveyor belt of mutations that last for several or a number of generations, eventually get removed. But all the while, more generations are being created and more mutations are occurring and more ADHD is back on the conveyor belt. So this idea explains how you could get a fixed, relatively stable percentage of a disorder within a population due to maladaptive genetic mutations, but it remains stable. Enough mutations are being created. They last for a while. They're eventually removed, but they last long enough to give us a stable prevalence across these generations. And that is the perspective of Keller, and it's a very convincing perspective at how maladaptive genes can remain within a population and not be adaptive, but still be there for a while before they get removed, because new ones are always being created. So in case you hadn't heard of it, there's some small amount of evidence at the moment to suggest that the genes for ADHD and the genes for autism spectrum disorder are the genes most sensitive to mutations. Among all of the genes within our DNA, most of them have been around for millions of years. They're very stable. The ones that weren't stable have been removed by natural selection. But the newest traits of humans that arise from a result of new genetic variations in humans genes for language, genes for social cooperation and functioning, genes for self-regulation. These are new. And as a result, they may still be prone to mutations at rates beyond the mutation rates of other genes, which appear to be more resistant to mutation. So this could then lead to the fact that we have ADHD and autism in the population at relatively stable rates, despite the fact that they're maladaptive and may contribute to earlier death, shorter life expectancy, the disorder still exists. So yes, there's selection against these genes, but that's being balanced by the rate of mutations within genes that creates it. So that would not be the case if these genes were, say, like the single gene for Tay-Sachs disease with a child who's going to die, uh, if not before birth, soon after birth. So there the gene is being removed from the population right away, but not the ADHD genes. These genes are not that bad where the maladaptive traits are such that people never survive and never reproduce. They do survive, they do reproduce. They go on to have long and often successful lives. But over multiple generations, the original genes are removed. So that's Keller's explanation. And I find it a very convincing explanation. You can go see the article. Uh, I'll put a citation in the thumbnail sketch for this video if you want to read that article. Now, there's further evidence against these adaptationist views. 
in that if they are adaptive at some point in history, but not adaptive any longer, that is, if they were, excuse me, adaptive, and against that are all the evidence that we have that ADHD traits lead to a great deal of risk for injury, death, suicide, homicide, multiple medical disorders, multiple health-related risks, overall culminating in a shorter life expectancy, according to my research, of about 10 to 12 years shorter life expectancy. That does not fit with a cultural mismatch idea, because what that suggests is even in earlier epochs of human history, these genes were wreaking havoc on people's ability to adapt through excessive risk-taking and a proneness to various medical and health disorders. So that's a little hard to square with this idea of a mismatch. Finally comes this brilliant study in 2020 that's in the journal Nature Scientific Reports, in which Kalkala and colleagues, a number of colleagues, took the databases for the genome-wide association studies that they could get their hands on involving tens of thousands of ADHD cases and typical cases. And out of that, they extracted what the risk genes are for ADHD. Let's just say there's 20 of them, just to pull a number out of our hat. Most people put it between 20 and 30, no matter. It doesn't change the point. The point is there's multiple risk genes, right? And we have an idea of what these genetic variants are. So what did they do? They went back into the genetic archives that now exist for earlier members of our species. We have DNA from members of our species that existed during the modern times, earlier history, Paleolithic history, and thanks to modern genetic techniques, we even have genetic profiles for Neanderthals. And they took the genetic evidence or the genetic uh, composition of these different human populations that existed throughout human evolution and compared how frequently these genetic variants were found in their DNA. And then they looked across each group to see were these being preserved in earlier hunter-gatherer times, hunter-warfare times, or were they being selected against even back then? And the answer is here. They found substantial evidence that throughout human evolution, natural selection has been acting against these genetic variants. So that is the death knell for the adaptationist view, as even they conclude in this article. These genes were much more prolific way back in primate and early human times, but have been selected against over time. But we reach a point where natural selection, though it's removing these genes from the population, as we talked about in the conveyor belt metaphor, there's enough new mutations to balance out that natural selection and we maintain a stable or relatively stable prevalence for the disorder. That's the best explanation that we have for the existence of ADHD and why it remains in human populations, even though it is not adaptive, but maladaptive. The mutations and the death rates equate to each other and keep us at a relatively stable prevalence. So I'll put both of the references to those very important papers in the thumbnail sketch. I hope you found this informative and hopefully not too technical, but it is the current scientific view of how ADHD remains in a population despite it being maladaptive and leading to a somewhat higher death rate. So uh, thanks for joining me, and I appreciate it. Russ Barkley here, just an aging baby boomer, reaching for continued relevance 
in late life. So join me again on this channel for further commentaries and research reviews. So thanks again, everybody. Be well.